Welcome to another episode of Inside Athletics brought to you by the IAAF. I'm your host, Atto Bolden. We are lucky enough today to be joined by the lovely and talented World 2017 Steeplechase champion, Emma Coburn. Emma, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, as I've already told you before we started, I thought that yours was my favorite moment of the World Championships. That tends to happen in events that I don't have to cover because I can just sort of sit back and watch it develop. But I want to start in a direction completely on the other side, and that is you got the first medal for the United States in the steeplechase in the Olympics, a bronze. Great accomplishment. And then you decided, oh, yeah, I'm going to change coaches. And it seemed to be a genius move because you went from Olympic bronze medalist to world champion. Why the change? And what is it that you knew that everybody else in the world had to figure out about your new coach and husband? <laughs> <laughs> My new coach and husband, I was lucky to start dating in high school. So oh, wow. I can't really, I am just lucky that we <laughs> fell in love when we were kids. <laughs> and he happens to be a brilliant coach. But um, yeah, 2016 went really well. I obviously owe so much to my old coaches. Mm -hmm. They've continued to have success um, over the years, and but I just thought for me it wasn't. I would just wasn't happy in that um, space anymore, and okay. so I wanted to try something new, and kind of took a risk. And <laughs> um, and everyone around me was really supportive, um, you know, just from friends and family, but also from a sponsorship perspective. Um, everyone kind of believed in me and thought a happy runner is a good runner. Right. And so, Which is true. Yeah. And, and so from a training perspective, I kind of sh shifted from training like a 1500 runner steeplechaser to more of a 5K runner. Mm -hmm. And I think developing that strength really helped me throughout the season have um, a better longevity a better strength throughout the season um, than I have in years past. I, I didn't feel like I fatigued as bad as I did in years past. So yeah. it worked out well. And yeah. Yeah, we got married a couple weeks ago, so things are good. Congratulations. So I think one of the reasons why your moment in London at the World Championships is, is my favorite of the championships, it's not just because here you are winning an unprecedented gold. It's because your training partner, Courtney Ferrix, behind you has, I think, one of the best reactions ever by any silver medalist in the history of the championships. So you had to be aware of where she was in the race, but okay, you win and you're happy for yourself. I know what this is like from the other side being the silver medalist. What's it like you turn around and, oh my gosh, you got the silver, we're one, two. It's really special. I mean, I, I'm lucky because the women's steeplechase internationally and and specifically in the u.s we all really get along yeah. and we um genuinely kind of root for each other and talk in the off season and yeah. we text and snapchat and communicate. really yeah so courtney and i courtney trains in oregon and i train in colorado and we obviously cross paths you know over the years racing but there is such a bond when you're wearing that usa across your yeah. chest and when you are friends outside of running and so i owe a lot of my race to Courtney because I saw her behind me on the Jumbotron. You know, every time I looked right. up, she was right there. <laughs> and there were moments in the race that I I typically maybe would have let off the gas a little bit and said, okay, just settle in. Like, yeah. You can let them go. They're going fast. But since Courtney was having a great day and was right behind me, I was thinking, if Courtney's here, I got to be here too. Right, right. Um, and so turning around my instinct immediately was to turn around and celebrate with her and yeah. enjoy that with her because it is, it was such a milestone event for both of us and she completely pushed me to get, um, you know, to get the win and I think her reaction, like you said, <laughs> was just so, so sincere and so sweet and I think it's a beautiful thing when you can see someone's genuine um, shock and awe in their own performance. Yeah, it makes all of that hard training uh, worthwhile. I always say the training and the hard work sort of fades into the into the memories and but that you know that that win and and feeling that that uh that thrill of having having accomplished something is forever um tell me a little bit about growing up in a state like colorado where running it's like eugene oregon where it's like running is just the thing to do from an early age, could you have sort of foreseen where you are now? Or was it, you know, well, maybe we'll see how it goes. Were you always sort of 
pointing in this direction from a young age? I was always an athlete, but I was never a runner. Like right. I, I grew up in a really active, small ski town where everyone skis and climbs mountains and mountain bikes and everyone is incredibly fit and incredibly mm -hmm. athletic, but there's no, not many, you know, D1 athletes right. that come out of my high school. Right. So, um, I definitely pursued athletics just as a joy growing up in this small town, but didn't ever see myself as even a college athlete, let right. alone an Olympian right. or world champion. So it wasn't until I was probably a junior in high school when I started dating Joe that I was like, oh, running's kind of cool and I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty good at it and maybe right. I should pursue it more. And I got recruited to run at Colorado yep. and it just kind of snowballed from there. But it wasn't even until probably 2011 that I thought, oh, I could make the 2012 Olympic team and be an Olympian. I was kind of a late bloomer when it came to what my aspirations in running were, but I, I always kind of saw myself as an athlete, like you said, growing up in a state like Colorado and specifically the town I grew up in. It's just, you know, activities and action all over <laughs> yeah. the place. <laughs> I think one of the things that makes your story um, of becoming a world champion that much more sweet is you look back at your competition record and you have paid your dues. 10th at Worlds and, you know, not sort of really being in the mix at the Olympics, but every time you clawed a little closer and closer, and then the Olympic bronze, and then the world title in 2017. Um, there's somebody who's maybe at that 10th or 11th position, and they're looking at you, and they're like, how did she do it? How did she go from being sort of an also-ran, if I want to be a cynic, to now being the world champion what's that what's that transition what happens in that space and time that's a that's a great question i think it it takes a lot of patience as you know to really um have longevity and to have continued improvement and i ran in the 2011 world championships was my first team and at the time my personal best was 937 and i wow. think i finished 10th Okay, I finished yet. Yeah. Yeah, like, thank you. <laughs> I know I made the final. And right. Then, um, and which was a great accomplishment. Right. You're in the final. Right. And I was the top American there. And right. so there, there were all these positive things that kept me motivated. Mm -hmm. But, but again, it's just staying hungry. And I think all of us as athletes, there's um, always going to be a level of uh, competition with yourself. And of always course. wanting to get the best. And you don't do all that training to be 10th. Yeah, yeah. And so I think there there just has to be a little belief that you can push yourself a little bit farther. And, mm -hmm. and every year, chipping off a few seconds off my time or a few places, it just, it became a natural path that my goal in 2015 was to win a medal. And I, I was disappointed in my performance and finished fifth. Mm -hmm. um, and then... 2016 went how it did and 2017 went how it did and it's not a guarantee that for the rest of my career I'll be able to win a medal but that's definitely where where the momentum and where my motivations lie now and it wasn't yeah that long ago that yeah. I was 937 and getting 10th but yeah just baby steps <laughs> um, I don't know how much of a student of your sport you are but certainly in my era which was a little while ago an American woman or American women being having this many medals in the middle distances, and I mean, forget the steeplechase. I mean, was just unheard of. Do you get a sense? Are you aware? I mean, I sh I'm sure you hear it, but are you really aware of, you know, 50, 100 years from now, they're going to be mentioning your name as she ushered in <laughs> this new era of American steeplechasing, middle distance running. I mean, this is something that is it's bigger than you. Well, I think it's, I, I feel that there is this energy and this, this movement in the middle distance, both for men and women, mm -hmm. um, in the U.S. right now, where we just really feel like we, we've paid our dues and we've worked our butts off and we, we, um, we earned those medals. And yes. so there is just this kind of fighting spirit that I think has always existed in the U.S. sprints and field events. And to be fair to the distance runners in generations pa generations past, they mm -hmm. were it hard, as hard if of not harder than me. Yes. But um, but it's just we're we're finding our time, and I think 
as as a spectator of the sport when I was in London and I watched Jenny Simpson win her silver mm-hmm. or Amy Hastings win her bronze, it really fired me up. I was I was incredibly moved by both of their performances because it made me believe that these are my peers, these are my friends. If they can do it, I can do it. And I think there is a a real positive momentum in the women's middle distance running and I'm happy to be a small part of it but I'm, I've received <laughs> I've received definite motivation from the women around me meddling as well. You mentioned Jenny Simpson and there's no doubt that she will probably go down as America's greatest um, in the middle distances. Um, how much of that I mean you, you've spoken about the inspiration that she was for you but is that an important thing for you for the generation coming? Is it important that young girls look at you and go, look at Emma Coburn, a, a Olympic bronze medalist, world champion so far and counting. I want to, that, that's what I want to be. Is that, is that an important thing to you that young kids, young girls especially look up to you and say, if she can do it, I can do it. I, I would hope that girls can look up to me and say, you know, and say that when I came into college, I was a freshman and Jenny was a senior and she totally opened my eyes to right. what was possible. And again, when you see a peer achieving greatness, it kind of makes you feel like that's possible for you. And right. that was my experience um, watching Jenny. And I would hope that that the young women in the steeplechase coming up now um, feel that motivation from me and Courtney winning medals. And I, you know, we're we're not too long ago we're in their shoes. And right. as we discussed, it's just a bunch of baby steps and a lot of years of work that you know you can achieve anything and it's cliche but if you work hard and and um, take care of yourself you can kind of achieve anything you set your mind to so I would hope that that we're inspiring girls younger than us I want you to think hard about if some of what had to be overcome with beating the African runners had to do with aura because some of these young ladies stepped to the line and they've beaten half the field already because they have these long extensive resumes and you know there's something about the African runners at least as a as an observer of the sport where you go yeah these you know some of these girls are born at 7,000 feet of altitude not that you coming from Colorado should be intimidated by that but do you feel like maybe that had to be sort of chipped at and maybe broken away so that you guys went, you know what, there's nothing that these young ladies from Africa can do that we can't do as well. I think that's a big part of it. And I think part of what has been fun in the last three or four years being in the women's, um, well, and just in general middle distance running in the U.S., we, we've chipped away at that uh, mystique a little mm-hmm. bit. And, and those women train really hard and they train at elevation. And there there are things that they can probably do in practice that I can't do. But there are also things I believe that I can do in practice that they might not be able to do. And I think one thing that Joe really uh, focused on in the last few years before he was my coach, just kind of getting my confidence before big races, mm-hmm. was that that these are just normal women. Right. Don't let the... They're not superheroes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that they're... They run with such confidence because they know we're all a little bit intimidated by mm-hmm. their resumes or what we expect them, what we expect of them. Yes. And so he really tried to focus on instilling that confidence in me, and then especially this year, this past year, being my coach in workouts every time when we were getting to the gritty hard parts of a workout, reminding me of what what my opponents are doing and that I'm as tough as them and and. I'm doing great workouts that maybe they couldn't do. And so I, I think chipping away at that, like you said, has been a big reason why we've had success as a group. I'm always fascinated by athletes who are married to the people that coach them because as a coach, I know that sometimes you have to say things in practice and treat the <laughs> athlete a certain way that maybe a husband would not treat a wife or I'll say things that a wife would not say to a husband. Give me a little bit of insight into what that dynamic is between yourself and your husband slash coach. It's, it's been going really well, and I think part of that is because we've been together for 10 years. Right. And so we really... This learned. is not a new thing, at least, yeah, apart and, from the coach thing. And I think, I think any athlete can speak that their partner is 
a huge part of their preparation, but, you know, even if they have no role in their training, right. it's the emotional side of it. And so that, the transition to having Joe be in charge of the coaching as well, <laughs> surprisingly went really smooth. And, <laughs> um, and there were times, I mean, there have been times that if I'm having a bad workout and I'm crabby, that I'll be a little snippy and moody. And Understandable. I, and I think like, well, that's not how I would really talk to a coach if I wasn't married to him. But, ah. but in general, that, that's probably happened like twice in the last year. Um, and one, one nice change is when we started um, training with Aisha Lear, the steeplechaser from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. She really helped make it clear to us without saying anything that it's the three of us at practice, this is practice, and then... So we treat each other like athlete and, and coach, leave it there. And, then, and then it leaves, and then we are home, and we're husband and wife. And so I think having a group really does help make the emotional dynamics seamless. I say all the time that uh, track and field athletes tend to be some of the most complete people and personalities. It's just that sometimes that part of them doesn't get exposed. What is the thing that sort of completes you? We know that you're a fantastic athlete. Um, it sounds like you're a fantastic wife if you're drawing lines in the sand and leaving things at practice and all that, but what are, what are the other things that complete you um, as a person? I, I'm a big family person and I have deep, deep roots in my hometown and whenever I get to um, go to Crested Butte, mm -hmm. see my family, train up there, that just completely fulfills me. And it, this past year, Joe and I started this uh, 5K road race in my oh, hometown nice. called Elk Run 5K. And the proceeds went to benefit a local charity that I've worked with for years. And so having um, events and things in my life that connect me to my hometown and the people that help raise me there and my family, that really is what kind of fulfills me and fuels me. My dream event is the 110 hurdles, but I was not tall enough. Um, do you look maybe at another, another event in your sport and go, maybe my next life, this is the thing that I would like to be uh, a star in? I, I don't know. I look at the 800 and it huh. terrifies me. Really? Like, if I could be incredibly skilled at the 800, I would have loved to do it. But it is, that's the, that's the event that I look at and it, it, impresses me every single time I watch it. It blows me away every single time I watch it. And so I think if I could live another life and have a different <laughs> different skill set in yeah. running, that that'd be really uh, a wild ride to be an 800 runner. Okay, so you look at the 800. I'm sure there are a lot of 800 runners that look at you guys. I mean, your event, you hit that, you hit that barrier. It's not going anywhere. You are going to fall. Um, the internet is full of videos of people who have not managed that water jump well. Um, what sort of personality does it take for somebody to look at every event in track and field and go, that's my event, <laughs> steeplechase? I, I don't know why other people try it, but I only tried it because I was in high school and yeah. I was going to a track meet to run an 800. And we were driving eight hours to get to this meet, and my dad thought it was stupid to drive eight hours and one do one way thing. to mm -hmm. run two laps. So the schedule, um, we looked at the schedule, and the only event available to double enter was the steeplechase. And yeah. we're like, I think you could be good at this. You play volleyball and basketball, and you, you're athletic. And that's related how? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. You know, I don't know if Kobe would be a great steeplechaser. We could ask. Right. But, um, but so I just signed up and ended up qualifying for nationals, high school nationals, and ended up getting recruited because of that. But I lucked into it because of a schedule, and then it just clicked. I felt so at home in the event, and the water jump felt incredibly um, like rewarding and exciting and really? fun. Yeah, I, fun. I, that water jump is fun, especially when that water is cold. Really? I yes, I look forward to it every lap. And, oh wow! And uh, <laughs> it's it's my favorite thing. So I can't answer why anyone else would try it, but I just did it because of a schedule. And it worked. So you've paid your dues. We talked about you know being tenth and sixth and some of these other positions that you were earlier in your career, and now you're an Olympic medalist and you're a world champion. What's the best part about now having this champion status um, and maybe something that's happened to you in the last 12 months that you go, huh, this is not something that happens to people who are not Olympic medalists and world champions? Um, 
I mean, getting invited to Monaco for Thanksgiving, <laughs> that's something different. Right? Um, you know, world champions and Diamond League champions get invited mm -hmm. among the other, um, you know, invited guests. Right. And that's, that's definitely something that's never happened before, and I had to... You know, I never pictured that I'd be spending Thanksgiving um, enjoying it in Monaco, but right. I'm loving it, and it's a it's a fun perk of being a world champion. But just in general, it's nice to have I think two successful seasons back to back, just to build my confidence that I'm doing the right thing and you know stay the course with this. And um, yeah, it's been really rewarding. So USA Track and Field fans will look at the current state of distance running in America and go, this is as good as it gets, and it's only going to get better. And a cynic may say, yep, the African girls are going to answer. Um, give me the argument for why you think American females are going to continue on this path um, in terms of winning medals at majors. Just within the steeplechase, I think that you have to look at at my progression um, and think that it makes sense for me to continue improving. I just turned 27, mm -hmm. and so I think I have a few more years Absolutely. of solid steeplechase <laughs> races left. Um, and then I think you look at the other two women who made the team, uh, Colleen Quigley and Courtney Frerichs, and they uh, train with Jerry Schumacher, who right. has such a successful Great record. runner. Mm -hmm. So I think just isolating the three of us and there are many other great women who are um going to be on teams that we're not on but there are the three of us i think have really solid coaching have very sound um progressions in our careers and so i think you can trust that we're going to continue training smart continue training hard and we'll race smart you know we we're typically kind of picky when we choose to race and all all three of us have peaked perfectly when it matters and so I think just isolating the three of us you can you can bet on us. Well as I told you before we started I thought your moment uh, with Courtney was my favorite of the entire world championships and uh, so thrilled for you and thanks for stopping by. Thank you.